Do you have announcements? There are none. Okay. <laughs> yeah, thank you. And a happy better new year. Oh, come on. I know there's only five of us here, but that's okay. We can still praise. I said happy better new year 2021. How about that? Yeah. I think in my old, older years or my younger years, if somebody would have said this year is going to be better than last year, I'd have been all for it, right? Hey, just real quick announcements before we get started with praise and worship this morning. Uh, January the 9th, uh, there's a couple of ladies in this area, I won't mention any names, that asked me to mention this, but the food pantry's greatest needs between January the 9th, February 14th, so you can start bringing these items if you're interested. It's a little bit of a switch for you. It's going to be like laundry detergents, bleach, dishwashing liquids, bath soap, paper towels, toilet paper. So I don't know if we have this list somewhere, but if not, we will have it next week. So just keep in mind, again, laundry detergents, dishwashing liquids, stuff like that is what they're looking for. And that'll start uh, the gatherings of January the 9th through the February 14th. I guess we'll do it the same way? Yeah. Okay. Does that sound good to everybody? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> Let's go, Kevin. So we're going to praise this morning. We're going to have a good time in praising God to get ready for... Uh, 2021 we also have communion today so there's a lot going on today now here's the other thing folks small crowd louder voices so everybody stand this morning
God is unstoppable. Yeah. 
gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you, Lord. Sing it loud. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you, Lord. Maybe see. It's great to see everyone this morning. <clears throat> As you can see, I'm going to talk just for a minute about missions. 2020 was a weird year. We all can admit, just strange. It started off like any other year. And then suddenly, craziness hit the country. And hit the world, for that matter. But that didn't change the fact that we still had a need for missions. That we still had a need to reach out, help those who are out there on the ministry field, help those that are lost and need to find Jesus. Not that he's lost, but they're lost. So, I'm going to take a few minutes here. <clears throat> Let's step down here so I can see what I have up on the screen. Um, Amy's going to point that towards the important stuff. And so, <clears throat> missions. It's an important part of our church. It's something that the elders we've prayed about for the past several years, and this has been something we've always been involved in but we've never really given an update on what's happening with our missions. So this year we want to do that. As we head into 2021, you can see some of the things that we have supported, and you can see some of the things we'll probably be supporting again. But not all of these. Some of these are very you know, situational. But I love this verse from 2 Corinthians 8, 7. But just as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in your love for us, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. Paul talking to the Corinthians, right? Gooseland Cares. We're going to start local. Gooseland Cares. Who here has heard of Gooseland Cares? Let's see every hand in the air, right? They do an amazing job. We as a church are not trying to duplicate what they already do really well. So we support them. We, we raise food for them. Uh, we got a, what, 160 pounds of just oatmeal and uh, cereals. Recently, if you don't know... That's a lot of oatmeal and cereal. That's, if you've ever you know, held a box of cereal, like that's a lot. I mean, it doesn't weigh very much. And that doesn't include the canned goods and all the other stuff that this church, this body, pulled together and donated. And this goes to a really good cause. We have people right here, maybe even in this church, but certainly within a stone's throw away, that are hungry, that need help in a lot of ways, medical and whatnot, food, shelter, so we support them. We're, we're, we're glad to do that. The YMCA, you know, the YMCA Youth Leadership Program. We all know we need to bring up our youth as leaders. So this is a great opportunity for us in a very small way, but we're able to donate to them. And the YMCA, for several years, for those who may not know, was an amazing blessing to us. They allowed us to use their facilities for Wednesday night services, and it was just fantastic. And they were just, they were just, a, just a real blessing. The Journey Home. This is out in Louisa. Basically provides spiritual, financial, vocational, and temporary housing services for people that need it. Uh, 5013C3, uh, they just built this. This is a brand new facility, $1.8 million. And they bring in people from Louisa and I think about a 40 mile radius that need help. We, we support them. American Cancer Society, you know, obviously, Ask Gracie. You know, obviously, we're, we've, we've sponsored that in the past. We have our own team. I don't think we did one this year because things were weird again. But uh, we definitely raised money for it. Gracie did a fantastic job raising money for that. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, I think it was the most money raised by any organization for that in Gooseland, if I remember correctly. Number two. That's okay. I'm going to call it number one. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm the one talking, so we'll call it. Uh, Salem Christian School. You know, look, we, we need our kids being raised up in the Word of God. We need schools that are going to do that. Unfortunately, our other school systems don't necessarily do that. Uh, not necessarily the fault of the teachers, but certainly of the system. So 
we wanted to support Salem Christian School, uh, and we do that. This basically at the bottom there, it says Calvary Chapel Frutos de Amor. That is in Costa Rica, uh, Ministry of uh, Calvary Chapel Placerville out of California. There what you see is, that's oh, kind of hard to see. All this smoke down here, that's all homes that were burned. As you can see, these are not fancy homes. These are shanties. These are only on a tin roof, uh, wood side, dirt floor type stuff. Um, so when we say they lost everything, they lost everything. So here we supported the church. They were doing an outreach into, there's a Calvary Chapel plant down there, Fruits of Stanmore. Uh, if you ever wanted to take a mission trip, that'd be an awesome place to be thinking about. Costa Rica. But you're certainly not, and Pastor Dave is dying to go there. Um, but I can tell you, this, this, is a, this is a hard place to work. I know you hear Costa Rica and you hear, <laughs> it's not like that. Uh, this is a, if you want to go do some serious mission work, this will be it. But anyway, we, we, we supported them as they do their outreach and help to the families that lost everything there. Help to persecute it. This is a Middle East outreach to the persecuted in, in the Middle East. Turkey, uh, Iraq, Syria. Um, they, they, they reach out. They provide support to families that are displaced, families that are maybe in uh, refugee centers. Um, I, I will say this about these, these, these little children here. They are probably braver than most of us. To hold that Bible, every two hours a Christian is executed in the Middle East. Every two hours. So if you think you're brave, go carry a Bible in the Middle East. So anyway, keep them in prayer, but we're, we're helping to support this as well. Calvary Chapel, Pristina. This is actually a personal friend of mine. David's got to know him as well, Mark. Mark and his wife, Celeste, have been working in the, uh, the old Soviet Union for a very long time. Um, here, you can see Mark. He's with some good-looking Marines. Um, and uh, I have a little bit of a bend towards that. For the Marines. Um, the, uh, they do an outreach there. There's military bases. They have, they have operational centers in, in Kosovo. He hasn't had a lot of luck this year. There's a new command structure there, and they really push back on him being able to talk to them and get in there and, 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 and you know, minister to, to our service members. Um, and they definitely need it. If anyone needs it, they definitely need it. Um, and plus, he has a, has a church plant there. The beauty about Mark and Celeste is that they're not seeing a lot of fruit there, but they haven't given up. They just stick it out. They're just bearing through it. Also keep Celeste in prayer. Uh, she, she's this good friend of my wife's. She's been fighting cancer for the last, I don't know how long. We're not talking very aggressive cancer. And she has to go to Greece every so often. So now getting through the borders is sort of a trouble and a pain, quite honestly. Uh, so keep them in prayer as they go back and forth between Kosovo and Greece, trying to get her, um, her medical needs taken care of. And uh, things aren't getting better for her. So just keep them in prayer. I just love the fact that their heart is God first, Jesus first, our personal needs second. Haiti. As you can see, guys, we're all over the place. We're not just here. We've got a lot of things going on. Calvary Chapel, Louisa. This guy, right there, the one in the middle, he's got an amazing heart for missions, and he has an amazing heart for the people of Haiti. So uh, he reached out and told us that they needed to have uh, their walls and the roof finished for one of their churches they were building, and we donated to have that happen. So as you can see, they have a church in the back of them. Let me tell you what, those people are going to use that thing to reach Christ. And uh, the cool thing is we had a little bit to do with that. So keep them in prayer um, if they continue to do that. Uh, by the way, the people here, a lot of people attending these churches are coming out of voodoo uh, witch doctor churches that are right, right in the area. So they're, again, very brave. This is not something that's taken lightly there. Uh, 99 Plus One Ministries. This is in San Felipe, Mexico. Uh, Jason, who, who's, who's taken over that ministry, he's my, one of my best friends. Um, and we've known his family for at least 10 11 years at least um, and they they do they have all kinds of things here they're street witnessing down in San Felipe not a lot of people showing up on the boardwalk 
Nonetheless, they got to go out there, and they did talk to those who came along. Um, they have a, a, uh, a ministry that reaches into some uh, senior care facilities. Uh, they, they reach out to feed the public. They, Jason mentors. Uh, he's fluent in Spanish. His wife is Mexican. And they, uh, he mentors young pastors that want to teach verse by verse, that want to do expositional teaching. And so uh, Jason loves the Lord. His wife loves the Lord. Kids are really into it, which is awesome. So San Felipe, Mexico, you know, all of these, keep all these people in prayer, guys. Here we are. Good old Randy Travis. Uh, we are soldiers of the cross. We've been found to reach the lost. You know, I couldn't wrap it up any better than that. But anyway, uh, if you guys have any missional ideas, if there's someone that you've been supporting, so one of the things we really like here is to, to have people come to us and say, you know what, I've been supporting this missional group for a year, two years. I know the person. I don't, whatever the deal is. But if you have some involvement and you can speak to, you know, who they are and what they do and how they're reaching out to reach the lost, that's just awesome. Come to David or myself uh, and let's talk about it. Uh, we specifically, if you guys don't know, we specifically set aside a portion of every week's giving to go towards missions. Um, missions is a major part of our mission for, for the Lord. And then as things start to loosen up, we're hoping to also physically get out and go do missions with actual people as opposed to just our money. But right now, the Lord's opening up doors for us to support them financially. So praise God for that. And with that, I'll turn it over to David. Isn't that amazing? You know, I... I, I've been on mission trips several, and the one thing I realize is, you know, when you first go to a mission trip, maybe it's your first time, and you're thinking, you know what, I'm going to be such a blessing to these people. You know, you get there, and they are such a blessing to you. You have no clue. And man, this is, this is part of what we want our DNA to be at Calvary Chapel, uh, is to make sure that we are all about giving that we're all about helping others because the love of God in our lives should compel us to desire to give, to help, to support. Because who here has not been helped in their life? We've all been helped in a mighty way. Nothing else. The most important thing, we had a real big problem with sin, didn't we? We had a sin problem we couldn't fix. And what did God do? He helped us. He provided a solution. He gave his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. Fantastic. All right, well, look at that. Just like that, we're in 2021. How about them apples? Y'all excited? So, so here's the deal. For me, I know there's a lot of folks who are like, I just can't wait to get rid of this corona stuff, da, da, da. Yeah, yeah, I'm with you. I want to get rid of this stuff, too. By the same token, 2021 is a new opportunity yeah, I mean, we're standing here, wide open fields in this area to reaching out and speaking about the love of Jesus Christ here and every which way. I'm excited to see what the Lord is going to do because let me tell you, he's done some tremendous things for us as a church. I know folks are like, 2020, I can't wait to get it. I'm like, we have been so blessed this year as a church. It is absolutely crazy. All right, so this morning we're heading back into 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Starting with verse 1, so if you have your Bibles with you, 1 Corinthians 16, starting with verse 1, and then we will partake of communion after that. Um, but since it's been a while since we've been in 1 Corinthians, just a quick, quick recap of a little bit our last few weeks. If you remember in 1 Corinthians uh, 15, oh goodness gracious, we spent four weeks talking about the resurrection. So Paul was giving us the what, where, why, who, how of the resurrection, and he concluded chapter 15 with these words. He said, therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. And so Paul's going to continue this theme. Uh, so remember, there wasn't like chapters that were inserted at his writing. It just kept going. And so he's going with the same theme of, now that you know about the resurrection, now that you know that your hope is secure, what are you going to do with it? 
What are we supposed to do while we wait for this resurrection? Are we supposed to be sitting on our couches going, man, I can't wait until he comes? Are we supposed to be doing something? Paul says, yeah, you're supposed to be doing something. And so he's going to start off the chapter talking about giving and then move towards the idea of planning. And that's where we're going to be this morning. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, thank you so much for your love and your holy word and just giving us a chance to give back. Oh, goodness gracious, Lord. I see the, the folks that are, are being helped. And, and just deep inside, I, I just want more. I want to do more, Lord. Please give us opportunities to do more. But Lord, as we are opening your word this morning, I pray that our, our focus is just on you. To learn from you. To be changed because of you. Father, we just welcome the Holy Spirit to just teach us, and remind us, and correct us, and rebuke us. Whatever needs to be done, you're here. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So, you know, I don't know if people are still partying for, for New Year's Eve or something. Just going, I'm looking around going, what, what did I say last week? We talked about unforgiveness. There should be a whole bunch of you, right? That's all right. Every once in a while we have a Sunday where it's just, okay. So, here we are, verse 1. It says, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so you also are to do. All right. I'm looking around. I'm waiting for people to start grabbing a hold of the sides of the chairs here. Look, some of you have come from backgrounds in which, you know, every Sunday, it seemed, the pastor is talking about giving money. It's like that's all they talk about. So maybe that's been your experience. Or maybe you've been in a, a church and where they have three or four times a year, you know that they're going to talk about giving, or, or some churches have a giving day, you know? We're going to give to the Alma Hunt or Lottie Moon or whatever it is that you, they give towards, and they have that day. Well, we're a little different here at Calvary Chapel in, in that we don't have a specific date or number of times in which we speak about giving. We go verse by verse through the Bible. So if the Bible talks about giving, guess what we're going to talk about? Giving. And let me go ahead and say this. No, we're not starting a capital campaign. We're not looking for money for folks for something specific. It just so happens in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, starting off the chapter, Paul is talking about giving, and so are we. But even though we don't talk about giving a lot, um, we certainly don't shy away from it. I mean, I love talking about giving because it's such an amazing blessing that God gives us. And once you get that mentality down, Pat, man, it's so fantastic. Because when you think that, look what I'm going to do for the Lord, all right, you, you kind of you lost it a little bit right there. But when you start saying, what? God's going to multiply this gift that I'm giving to help further his kingdom? He's allowing me, of all people, me, to participate in providing healing and blessing and, and nourishment and, and, and Bibles and the, and the truth. To get shared with others. I mean, that's just an amazing blessing. But as we just looked at over here, um, it's really me preaching to the choir. Because y'all are doing a fantastic job. Y'all really are doing a fantastic job overall as a church and giving. And that's a heart issue, you know? It's all about the heart when it comes to giving. And I love y'all's heart because you guys are doing great things. You're opening your wallets and your hearts to those that are in need. So, here's the deal. Some of y'all have no problem for us talking about giving. Some of you are grabbing for that wallet, or that purse, clutching the sides, waiting for the place to start being passed. We'll go ahead and take care of that now. No, I'm just kidding. There's, that's perfect time. Preston comes to the door. No, no. So, no, we're not passing any plates around here. And we've intentionally done that. We made a determination as a church um, when we first started, that we're not passing plates around. Now, there's nothing wrong with passing plates around, but um, we decided we want uh, folks to feel uh, the desire to give and not being compelled. It's not compulsory where you have to. So we have a box in the back. So as you come in or as you leave, you put your giving there, but it's, it's, we're not going to make you feel bad. You know, have you all ever been there? Where you go to a church, maybe it's like a revival or it's something, and you're like, oh, this is just a so-and-so. And you're there and sitting down there, and suddenly they start going row by row with those bad boys. And it comes up to you, and you're sweating bullets, 
You reach it into your pocket, you forgot your, your wallet, it's in the car. You didn't like stuff in your, your pockets and you're going, oh, what's gonna happen now? What am I gonna do? Am I just gonna act like I'm putting something in there and move on? Or if I just, what are people gonna think if I take it and just quickly pass it over to the next person? Are people gonna be judging me? We just didn't want that. It shouldn't be that way. See, the Lord loves a cheerful giver and, and hopefully that's our desire is to give cheerfully, to create an atmosphere where, where hearts are changed to where giving is not a chore, but it's an opportunity, a blessing to demonstrate your love and your faithfulness to the Lord. Who, who gives you what? Everything. Everything. Is there anything that you have that you said, that's mine, look what I did? Mm -mm. God gave us everything in the first place. It's a chance to participate, to demonstrate our generosity in helping others that are less fortunate supporting the functions of the church. All right, so this is what Paul is talking about here. We got it? Are we tracking? Ooh, wow, sirs. <laughs> Are we on the same page, amen? Amen. Okay. I need a hallelujah there, Pam. Hallelujah. All right. <laughs> so what is Paul speaking of here about giving specifically? Paul's talking about giving to the church and, and the folks in Jerusalem. Um, so what's going on in Jerusalem that he feels the need to collect this this offering for these folks in Jerusalem? Because Jerusalem's a long way away, isn't it? From Corinth, it's a long ways away. And we're talking about totally two different people. The folks in Jerusalem were made up mostly of Jewish folks, and the folks in Corinth were mostly Gentiles. Now, y'all been with me long enough, most of you, to know, and we preached on this, that the, the Jewish folks didn't have a high esteem, a high view of the Gentiles so much. And I think it went both ways. So here's the deal. If you remember from the book of Acts, the day of Pentecost, when suddenly the Spirit just moves in, it's the birth of the church, um, all kinds of amazing things were happening, miracles, outpouring of generosity, a fresh movement of the Spirit. And there were a whole bunch of people that were there to celebrate Pentecost from all over the world. They were there in Jerusalem. And all this stuff started happening, and what were they thinking? Man, this is awesome, Daniel. This is awesome. This is great. This doesn't happen where I'm at. I'm here in this place. Oh, this is, honey, we're going to move here because I want to be part of this, right? We want to be part of an amazing movement of God. And I hope you all feel that way. We want to be part of that amazing movement of God. And so they decided, yeah, we're going to stay here. We're going to camp out because I like what's happening here. And they didn't want to leave. It was an exciting time for the church as things were just moving and shaking. But here's the problem with that. In the Great Commission, is there anywhere in there that the Lord told us to stay where we are? To just look for a movement of the Spirit and stay there forever? To have a bunch of Bible studies and create a megachurch? No, he told us to go. He said, go, leave Jerusalem and share the gospel with the rest of the world. And by the way, that's almost everyone at this point. So how does God handle things when we don't listen to him? Now listen, I'm sure there's no one here. There's no one here in which God told you to do something and you said, uh, maybe I didn't hear right. I've got my, I think I heard something different. That can't be God telling me to do that because I've got my own plans and agenda. What does God do when you refuse to listen to him? He tends to get our attention one way or another he's going to get our attention now in the case of the christians those that were there in jerusalem um he got their attention there was a famine there suddenly came there's suddenly this famine and also there was severe persecution of christians there in jerusalem i guess that's a way to get people to leave right oh you don't want to leave mm -hmm. all right i'm going to send you a famine we're going to start having some persecution against the Christians. So a bunch of the folks left, but still there was a bunch of folks that stayed. And we know in reading it, throughout the book of Acts, there were some issues with, with the widows and things like that. There was a lot of people to take care of. And so they were struggling because of this famine, because of the persecution. But notice in our verse here, Paul is not singling out the church in Corinth. He's not saying, look, I, you guys are going to bear the brunt of what's going on here. So I need you guys to take care of these folks in Jerusalem. I was not expecting one thing from one church and another from another church. He said that the churches in Galatia were also giving. All right, verse 2. 
On the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up as he may prosper, so that there will be no collecting when I come. And when I arrive, I will send those whom you accredit by letter to carry our gift to Jerusalem. If it seems advisable that I should go also, they will accompany me. Okay. In our text, we see that Paul explains how he wants folks to give. It's not a spur-of-the-moment thing. It's a planned thing. It's not getting to church and then reaching in your pocket, can he? And you reach in there, and what do you got? You got like a empty candy wrapper, a half-eaten Tootsie Roll, and a paper clip. <laughs> what do you do with that? It's not what he's saying. He's like, you need to plan in advance of what you're going to give. It needs to be thoughtful. It needs to be planned. And saints, again, this goes to a heart issue. Paul is specifically talking about an offering collected um, for the folks in Jerusalem, but he's creating a blueprint for giving in general. So I want us to see this. This is a blueprint for giving in general. And so in this blueprint, the first thing he shows us is that giving should be planned and regular. Now, I don't know how many folks here have uh, a planned giving uh, set up at your family, at your house. Like, you guys all know what we're, we're going to do. This is what we're going to do as a family. This is what we've decided as a family. We're going to give da-da-da-da, that kind of thing. Um, if you don't have one, I recommend you do it. I think it's good. It's beneficial. It's, uh, it's necessary in my mind. Because if you determine to give what's left, what are you going to find? <laughs> There's rarely anything left, is there? If you determine to give God the first fruits of your labor, even if you don't know how that's going to work out, always does. Now, I'm not saying it's going to be smooth sailing and easy the whole time. That's for sure. But it's going to eventually work out. I remember the first time when Amy and I, we decided that we were going to start tithing. So we were going to a church down in Richmond and, you know, just sitting in the congregation, listening to the sermons going on. And we kept hearing these sermons about, you know, you can't outgive God. You know, he will bless you. He says, test me in this. Now, God actually says that. When it comes to giving, he says, test me in this. He didn't say that all over the place. You're not supposed to test the Lord. But he says, test me in this. So we're sitting here going, you know, our finances are a wreck. You know, at this point, we were just, we were, uh, we, just didn't, we didn't have kids at that point, did we? Mm -mm. So we were just living, going out to eat all the time, this, that, and the other. And you know, I was living off of straight commission, 100%, and, and that kind of thing. So uh, we determined we need to do something. And so we made the determination that we were going to start tithing. Because we heard all these stories, so let's do this. And so we did. We started to tithe. And boy, it was hard at first. But then it got even worse. I get a phone call from the church treasurer that said, Hey, um, the check that you wrote bounced. Talk about embarrassing. When the church treasurer calls and says, you didn't have enough money in your checking account to cover what you wrote. So once that happened, Amy and I looked at each other, and we're like, I feel so small. I, I never want to do that. I never want that to happen. I felt awful. What do you do? So we were like, you know, maybe this thing's not, we can't do this. It's not the right time or whatever. But we came around, and we said, no, we're going to keep trying. God said, test me in this, and I'm going to test him in this. And so we kept going. And then after a while, it got easier and easier, and we haven't looked back. Now, if you say, well, I don't know how it's going to happen. I, that was us. How are we going to get the... Suddenly a check comes in out of some place. Or work picks up. Something happens to where we were able to take care of things. But again, it's not always easy at first, um, and the devil is not going to make it easy for you. God has blessed us so immensely, especially living in the United States. Uh, I've been on trips to some third world countries, and let me tell you, we are so blessed in terms of our, our quality of life, um, our resources. You go over there and wowzers. But the interesting thing is, you're going to see some of the happiest people in the world. They're not worried about who's got, who doesn't got, nobody's got nothing. And they're all happy with each other because they've got the same and they're happy and they're, it's just an amazing thing. But, I mean, we're talking no running water inside the house. We're talking about day-to-day -day food issues. We're talking about the same clothes. You know, you get embarrassed if you're wearing a clothes that you wore Monday of last week and you're wearing it Monday again this week. 
And you're like, oh man, people are gonna know. The same clothes every day. It's amazing. And our gratitude for these blessings should help us to desire to give. Now let me ask you this, does God need our money? He owns a cattle on a thousand hills. Is there anything that he did not create? He doesn't need our money, but he gives us a chance and an opportunity to bless others, to do the work of ministry. He wants us to participate. That's what blows my mind. That's what makes my noodle. He wants us to participate. Me? You want me to do what? Yeah, okay. And there's so many people in this world that are in need. And again, y'all have been fantastic. As Mike shared with you this morning, as a church, y'all have helped so much, so many different people. You've helped people inside this church that were hurting, that needed money for whatever the case may be. Y'all have helped with people in Louisa and Goochland and, and, and continuing on, North Carolina and, and you know, Mexico and across continents. Y'all have done it. You've gotten it, and it's fantastic. As a church, we made the decision when we first started out that we were going to give 15% of everything that we get to set aside for missions. Now, this is more than a lot of churches. Let me just assure you of that. But we wanted to create a culture through example of this is what we're going to do. And so everything that comes in, 15% of that is straight to missions. And it's, it's what we wanted to do. And I hope that everyone can see that y'all's money is being used towards amazing, amazing help and resources for those that are in need. But it all starts with the heart. If your heart is right, your desire to give follows. If you're not sure how to start, start with something. So Paul calls for giving to be planned. Secondly, he calls for each person to give. This is not a have and have not thing. This is not the, the, the folks with money are going to give, and we're just going to thank them. That is so nice. I'm so glad. I'd give if I could, but... You guys, I'm so grateful that y'all did that. Nope. All calls on each person to give. We all have a responsibility to give back a portion of what God has blessed us with. But what portion? Uh, that brings us to the third piece of our blueprint. He calls for us to give as we may prosper. You notice he doesn't say anything about giving a tithe, a tenth. Instead, he gives... He tells us that we are to give as we've received. Now, in the Old Testament, it's all about the tithe, wasn't it? That's what they did. It's 10%. You knew that. That's law. 10% gives Abraham, Elzadek, and the whole thing. We know this. 10%. That's what we're supposed to do. But Jesus didn't talk about the tithe much, did he? I mean, the time that he did talk about the tithe, it was in the context of criticizing the Pharisees because they tithed everything, even down to the you know smallest of seasonings. God's desire is that we are cheerful givers. And so, you know, Bob, go ahead and cover your ears right now. <laughs> Listen, if giving makes you mad, if you're giving begrudgingly, then keep your money. That's not God's desire. He doesn't need your money. Now you're also going to lose your rewards. And you're going to have to address your heart issue at some point. But if you could stand in front of that offering box and you're like, I don't want to let go of this. And your hand is like over the top of it. And you just, and your spouse is elbowing you. You know, don't let that be you. Put it back in your pocket. Walk out, have your discussion with your wife or your husband or your friend or just yourself. Whatever it is. God doesn't need our money. He allows us to. So his desire is that your heart is changed, that you're joyful in your giving because you know where this is going, right? It's going to help others. God's desire is that our heart beats to give, that our default is set to giving. And for some, that's way more than a tithe. Now, the widow gave him her last two mites, didn't she? That's less than a penny. Whereas the Pharisees, man, they were all about that tithe. They tithed everything. A whole bunch more money than she did. But they had the ability to give more. So who received the bigger blessing? That widow. In our culture today, it's all about the latest, greatest, best, popular, most newest of things. But do we really need it? 
Now y'all about to y'all curl up your toes here. Because here's the deal. I hear so many stories of folks that are spending all their money on guns, on shoes, on tech stuff, but they have no desire to give to others. And it hurts my heart. When Amy and I did that financial piece with the Dave Ramsey thing, we started to get excited about living on less. It became an obsession to us to see how little we could spend each month. We stopped going out to eat as much. Those must-have things weren't must-have things anymore. And it was healthy. Being, breaking yourself from materialism, even though you may not see it, is such a healthy thing. It really is. I love the story of Rick Warren. Y'all know Rick Warren? He's a pastor of that mega church, you know, Saddleback. And he's also the writer of The Purpose Driven Life and a whole bunch of other books. Well, his desire was to give. And so he was giving, and what he found is that he wanted to give more. And he wanted to give more and he wanted to give more. And so over time, what's happened is he now reverse gives. He reverse tithes. So he gives 10% and he gives 90% away. How'd you like to be able to do that? Isn't that something? But it's, it's, it's really, it's a choice, gang. Okay? It really is. Uh, when we were going through that, that thing, man, it was so good to just see how little we needed. It was all like a competition. When's the last time we spent? Two weeks ago, ah, oh, we could beat that. <laughs> you know? Now some of the things you gotta do, you got your gas, this, that, and the other. But our desire was to take that money and be able to use it to help others. And it's a beautiful thing. And some of you may look at what Rick Warren did and say, well, that's because he's rich. Of course, he's able to do that. Well, here's the deal. If you're not able to start giving when you're not rich, you're not going to give when you are rich. If you've ever talked to folks or met with folks or saw interview with folks that have lots of money, they're not all about giving a bunch of money away. They're all about getting to that next level. I've got 10 million, but I really want to get to that 25. I really want to get to that 100 that half a billion or trillion, whatever. That's what they want to, to get to. And so it's the same way. So if you're not starting now, you don't think magically you're going to start doing it when, when the money does come in. We need to start now. Just see how God blesses you with this and give as, as you've been prospered. I mean, how many of you have ever seen a farmer go and get seeds? And I can say this because it's like one from southern states or wherever. You go out there, and he gets the seeds. He has this huge area plowed up. We're out here in the country, so y'all should be getting this one. And so he's got the whole area plowed up. Let's, let's say it's Cecil. He built this big old garden. And uh, so Cecil goes, and he gets those seeds, and he starts dropping them. One. Two. And then he stops. He's got a bag full of seeds, and he's putting two in there. What? Why? Would you think he was crazy? Why are you just putting two? You plowed up this whole thing. You got two seeds in there. Why would you do that? Would you think he was crazy? Yeah. Would you call a farmer crazy that took a bunch of seeds and scattered it all over the place in, in an area that he had plowed? Would you think he's crazy? No. He's doing what he's supposed to do, right? Because what's going to happen is the more he sows, the more he's going to reap. reap right? Even take a thing of corn. Plant one thing of corn, what happens? Do you get one ear of corn that comes out of it? Sometimes. You get <laughs> Jesus had some bad luck with corn, so he's like, yeah, sometimes. Usually you get a bunch of ears of corn to pop up, right? So it's, it's a, a concept that also works in giving. We reap what we sow. So sow, um, don't sow sparingly, but sow in abundance, so you may receive an abundance. All right, so in verse 3 and 4, we have the fourth principle in giving, and that is that Paul didn't just take the money there in Jerusalem and say, hey, I'll take that, thank you, bye. Right? What did he say? Hey, you guys appoint some folks that you think are good to go, good character folks, and let them take it to Jerusalem. If you want, I'll come with you guys. I'll walk with you guys. I'm going to Jerusalem anyway. So I'll go with you guys with this bag of money. Paul didn't say, I just I want to take it by myself. He wants people that are there to hold him accountable. He wants accountability. And that's what we should have, right? Here at the church, we have accountability. Because there's always two people that are counting money every Sunday. Whatever's in that box, is two people are, are counting that. And making them just all that good stuff. And not to mention, um, Mike and I, we get the monthly statements. 
We know how much is given each and every month. All the transactions are listed. Now some of y'all sweat. Here's the deal. I don't get names. We don't get names of who gives what. We get amounts. Some of y'all are like, oh man. I gotta put my name on it or something. Hey, can you just put my name on your retirement check? Not to mention, if anyone wants to know what's happening to the money that comes in, um, just see Bob Whitehead, talk to Rhonda McClendon. Um, they'd be more than happy to show you our finances, our financials of where things are giving. We want to be transparent. We want people to be able to see exactly what's going on. But I gotta tell you, I've been at a church where we printed off those financials each and every month, and we set them in the back corner, like in the back of you. Hey, everybody come and get one when you're done. You come, you go and get your, your pick up your financial statements or whatever. Yeah, those things stayed there. Nobody ever looked at them. And so our mentality is this. You want to see them? Just see Bob, see Rhonda. They'll make it available to you. No problem. Okay? But this also works in our own personal lives, right? Have an accountability partner for your giving. So create your giving plan, and then have someone that's going to hold you accountable. For me, it's my wife. She's, my, she's the one that does our finances, so she's my accountability partner. So if I go off the rails, and I'm like, you know what? This offering that we're going to do, I was really looking at this handgun. You know? Man, it's got this tritium night sights and this scope and all kinds of stuff, and it's, it's awesome. Yeah, some of y'all are going, a scope on a handgun? Yeah, that's how bad mine is. No, no. No, but, but if I start doing that, she's going to hold me accountable and go, I don't think so. She's going she's gonna to be Johnny on the spot to call me out. All right, we got it on giving. We got this. Say amen or we keep going. Amen. amen. Suddenly it got real loud, right? All right, y'all can rest a little easy because now in our text, Paul's moving from planning to give to planning to minister. So we're going to start with verse 5. Paul says, I will visit you after passing through Macedonia, for I intend to pass through Macedonia, and perhaps I will stay with you, or even spend the winter, so that you may help me on my journey wherever I go. For I do not want to see you now, just in passing. I hope to spend some time with you, if the Lord permits, but I will stay in Ephesus until Pentecost. For a wide door for effective work has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. All right, so Paul is writing this letter from Ephesus. And his plan was to pass, uh, when he was pa after passing through Macedonia, to come to the church in Corinth and spend some time with them. And not just do a drive-by, but spend some good time. But things didn't go as he planned. And so this shows us two different things on leadership. And the first one that we're going to see here, in the planning phases of ministry and leadership, is that... Um, you need to make sure you communicate. Paul wanted them to know exactly what he was doing, what he was planning on doing. How many disagreements and arguments have come from a lack of communications? A lot, right? Whether you're a leader, whether you're married, whether you're, you're single, you got a boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever it is. Lack of communications at work. Oh boy, that's a big one. Because here's the deal. If people don't know what you're planning, what are they going to do? They're going to assume. And I'm not going any further than that. They're going to assume. And here's the deal when someone assumes. What they're assuming is they're assuming that they know your intentions, your plans, the reasoning behind why you're doing what you're doing. And here's the problem with that. Uh, usually, they're wrong. And usually, what they're assuming is not very flattering towards you. So we have to make sure that we are communicating um, pretty frequently. And so that's what Paul is doing. Look, I'm going to get you up to speed on my plans. But number two, Paul remained flexible. Although Paul had his own plans of what he wanted to do, he knew that his plans were always secondary to the Lord's. And he demonstrated this in verse 7 when he said, if the Lord permits. So Chuck Smith, the founder of Calvary Chapel, used to have a saying. He said, blessed are the flexible for they shall not be broken. It's not in the Beatitudes. You can look it up. <laughs> but that's what he's saying. Now, this is not to say that we shouldn't plan. I'm a big planner. And yes, my wife can say amen to that. Every morning I wake up, I've got an Excel sheet that lists out my days. And on it are the things that I expect to do that day. And at the end of the day, I go back and I highlight in yellow the things that I get done. 
And the things I don't get done, I just uh, erase. No, no. <laughs> I either move them over to a different day, or I've, I've realized I don't like the way it looks, so I've changed the color to red to remind myself, bad. So I changed the color to red that it didn't get done. But that's what I do. And planning is a good thing. Mike and I, uh, we meet on a monthly basis during our elders meetings. We're supposed to meet and talk about short-range plans, long-range plans for the church, what we expect to happen, what's going to happen. But I've also learned through the years that if I'm not flexible, I'm going to get very aggravated when things change. Mm -hmm. Have y'all been there? How many of y'all struggle with this? Come on, we're in church. That's good. That, that's me. You know, I've got a plan. I spent all this time planning. This is my plan. And then something drops, and it's like, oh, 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 you got to be kidding me. So over the course of my life, I've had to realize, not that I've mastered it by any means, but that if things don't go the way that you want, you need to be flexible in that. And i got to tell you, in ministry, I could plan all day. That little Excel sheet uh, looks beautiful, doesn't it? Oh, it's so pretty. Look at all these colors. But what happens on a day-to-day -day basis? I got my plans. I'm going to go work out, and then I'm going to start working on the sermon, and then the Bible study, and then I'm going to go do this visitation. I'm going to do that, and then I get a phone call. So-and-so passed away. I need you to be here. <coughs> So-and-so is struggling right now. So-and-so is at the hospital. So th all these things are going on. It's I, I can't go... <laughs> I'm supposed to be at the gym in five minutes. So, you got to be flexible. And these are good words, not just for leaders, but for all Christians. Because when the Lord has plans for you, you stop what you're doing. And you do what he asks. The struggle on our part is when his plans and our plans do not line up. And we start complaining, don't we? Oh, but Lord, I had this thing planned and I really wanted to do it. And you know what we start to sound like? A bunch of teenagers who don't want to go to a family reunion. <laughs> Talk to their parents. Aww. Now, my parents are pretty straightforward. If I try to pull that on them, mm -hmm. you know what they'd say? You're going to like it. You're going to go, and you're going to like it. How can, they make, how can they make me like it? Oh, don't make me like it, all right. <laughs> or at least look like I like it. You having fun? Mm-hmm. <laughs> You can never go wrong in obeying the Lord's plans for your lives. Even if it doesn't make sense. Even if we don't want to do it. Even if it conflicts with our super fantastic, terrifical plans that we have had in place for like 22 years now. But God says, yeah, not so much. Listen to God. Paul saw a huge door that was open for ministry in Ephesus. And he wanted to take advantage of it while he could. Now we know how the rest of the story ended because we went through the book of uh, Ephesians. Now, Paul, that door was open, yeah, but how did things work out for Paul in Ephesus? Oh, man, they kicked him out, didn't they? They ran him out of the, the, the city, but not before he had some converts, some folks that became Christian. Not before those folks gathered together and they started to have a church. Mission accomplished. And this is true in our lives. When we start to do something for the Lord, and suddenly we get a whole op bunch of opposition that wasn't there before, how do we react? This must not be what the Lord has for me because it's so hard. Listen, do you think the, the devil is scared to death of a bunch of folks that gather on a Sunday for an hour and they smile and they sing and they shake hands and, oh, life is good? Do you think he fears that? Not even a little bit. He's like, if that's all you're doing, good for you. I'll let you meet on Sundays. I'll make it nice and bright and sunny. You guys just come and sit down and feel like you're doing something for God. I'm happy with that. Where he starts to get mad, where he starts to get uneasy, is when we meet together for prayer, when we decide that whatever was taught that morning in church is going to change us, when we do what the Lord is asking us to do, to act, that's when he gets upset. That's when he sends out his minions and goes, no, 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 no. I want an ineffective person that calls themselves a Christian. I don't want a Christian that's, that's more than just words. I want, I want that guy that just sits there and goes, 
yeah, this is who I am. I come to church on Sundays for an hour. You've got a favor. And then I go back home and live my own life until Sunday of next week. Oof. But here's the thing. I think too many times we mistake easy for within the Lord's will. When it's usually just the opposite, isn't it? Well, if it's the Lord's will, it's going to be easy. Is that always the case? Oh. The Lord's will, man, he starts, the devil starts putting up those roadblocks in a big way. All right, we're going to finish off with these last two verses. Verse 10. It says, When Timothy comes, see that you put him at ease among you, for he is doing the work of the Lord as I am. So let no one despise him. Help him on his way in peace, that he may return to me, for I'm expecting him with the brothers. So it appears that Timothy, young, Paul's young apprentice, Timothy, y'all remember Timothy? He's going to visit the folks in Corinth. And that should be a good thing, right? But Paul still had to give them instructions, the Corinthians, to behave. When Timothy comes. And from reading Paul's letters to Timothy, we can glean that Timothy may have been struggling a little bit with self confidence. And that may have been partly due to the opposition that he often faced. And so Paul is thinking about this and he's going, All right, Timothy's going to come. Oh, wait a minute, Timothy's coming? Let's see, these Corinthians have been pretty snarky to me. They've opposed me at every turn, or a lot of them. They have not. Uh, considered me an apostle. They've disrespected me. They've divided themselves along different lines. Uh, and I'm going to send young, fragile Timothy to them. I should probably give them some instructions. And so that's what he does. He says, look, put them at ease. Don't despise them. Help them on his way. And that shows the loving nature of Paul. A good leader takes care of those under their charge. All right, so this morning we talked about giving, planning, and some leadership attributes. The bottom line of all of this is that we're to follow the Lord in all things. With our hearts, <clears throat> with our wallets, with our plans, with our actions. And when we do, we will be blessed. Okay, so we're going to close in prayer. And then what we're going to do is we're going to offer some time of fellowship. Um, Again, we're still under these weird circumstances, so fellowship within your distance. I, I've talked to you guys about this before. I want us to have that fellowship before we partake of communion, because that's what they did in the early church. And I think it's a vital part of who we are in our DNA. So let's go to Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you for your word and allowing us the privilege of participating and furthering your kingdom, Lord. I pray that you allow us to use every last resource that we have, Father, and the best advisable way to bring glory to you. Father, I pray that you give us hearts that just beat for others. And Father, we know that Jesus says that's, that's how we know that we are truly his disciples, that we care for one another, that we love one another. And so, Father, I, I pray that we demonstrate this love, not just in word, but through our actions. Father, help us to be your hands and your feet. I'm sure we all know that feeling of being in need and that helplessness. And to have someone come along and just offer that hand to help out. But we didn't know where it's going to come from. And Lord, you allow us to participate and be that. What a blessing. Father, I thank you for your love and the time that you've given us today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so take some time now and just fellowship with one another. Be joyful. I know it was a giving sermon, but be joyful, be happy, say hello, meet some new friends.
I say go fellowship, and that is to get y'all back together. But listen, as long as y'all are getting back together, we can continue to do this because fellowship is so important. All right, so this is the time in which we're going to partake of communion together. And listen, I know we're going a little long. Um, but I think it's important that we had our mission update. And that's the first time that we've done something like that. And I wanted everybody to know what's going on. And I think it's fantastic. So what we're looking at now is a time in which we can just focus. Just take a moment. And I want you all to focus on what Jesus did for each and every one of us. Um, I remind you again that this wasn't a plan B. God sent his only begotten son for us. Before the foundations of the world, this is this is what he planned. I I can't fathom. Um, I mean, I've got twin little redheads over here, but and they're like, who? <laughs> yes, you're mine. That's what Amy tells me. Um, so so here's the deal. I can't imagine the idea of God giving up his own son to die. It's tough. Parents, could you do it? But that's how much he loves you. And Jesus, Jesus uh, had this, I mean, fully man, fully God. And he had that opportunity and, and just tempted, just like we are. It was that perfect sacrifice for us. That night of, in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was praying. Drops of blood. Because he knew what this was going to entail. He knew it was going to be painful. He knew that he'd be abandoned. He knew that he'd be rejected. But he also knew it was the only way. And he loved you and me that much. So for just a moment, just bow your heads. And in, in silence, how about let's, let's thank the Lord for what he did for us. Let's thank our Father for sending his Son. Thank you, Jesus, for being obedient when he said, not my will, but yours be done. And get our get our minds straight in terms of if there's any sins that you need to repent of, repent of them. Anything you need to get straight with your brother or sister, get it straight. Lest we eat or drink judgment upon ourselves. So just take a moment. On the night that Jesus was to be betrayed with his disciples, I'm so thankful that he had that. To spend that last bit of time with his disciples. People who he loved. And they loved him. But he took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it. And he passed it to them. And he said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now as we look at the cup, the red color, what a visual reminder to us of the blood that was shed for you and me for forgiveness of our sins. That blood is real. Jesus felt all the pain. The sting of rejection, the sting of being abandoned, and the sting of those spikes as they were hammered through his hands, his feet. But he endured it all because he loves us that much. 
In the same manner, after supper, Jesus took the cup and said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Father God, we are so thankful for the shed blood of Jesus Christ. His body was broken for us, but we know that we have salvation through this blood, through his body. It's the hope that we have, and Lord, we know that all hope is not lost because what Jesus did for us in dying on that cross, the tomb didn't remain filled. It was empty on that third day. He arose took away all of our sins. So we know that we have hope. We have salvation. And Lord, we look forward to that day in which we partake of this in heaven together as family. Thank you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. So I'm going to be over here and uh, I'd ask Amy to come over here. And if anyone needs prayer for something, you know, the holidays are a difficult time and we're just getting through those. And maybe this during the holidays, people are checking on you. They know you're having a tough time. How you doing? Is everything okay? Why don't you come for Thanksgiving? Come on for Christmas? But these holidays are gone. And we're starting to feel maybe alone again. If there's anyone that needs prayer, you're going through a difficult time, you need help, you just want to thank Jesus. I'll be over here. Amy will be over here. Come and, and speak with us or anyone that wants to know Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior. I'd love to talk about Jesus. So please come see me, but let's stand and sing our last song together.
everybody have a great week. Pray for each other, lift up each other, and a happy new year.